This week on the Hollywood and Toto podcast, Dwayne Johnson ditches President Biden? And that's not even the most amazing thing he told Fox News. Director Kia Roche-Turner shares why he made the new horror movie Sting and whether it curbed his chronic arachnophobia. And why Curb Your Enthusiasm got away with something that most shows would get canceled for in a heartbeat. Welcome to the Hollywood and Toto Podcast. Entertainment news and reviews without the woke Hollywood narrative. Free speech, free expression. Now that's entertainment. And here's your host, award-winning film critic, Christian Toto. Before the show officially begins, I'd love it if you subscribe to the Hollywood and Toto podcast. We've got new shows each Wednesday, plus bonus episodes, too. And if you like what you hear, could you give us a review over at iTunes? Every syllable helps, and we appreciate it. We can smell what The Rock is cooking, and it's bipartisanship? This is legitimately the craziest Hollywood story of the week. I couldn't ignore it. Dwayne Johnson visited Fox News recently. Okay, it's already crazy, right? What big star goes on Fox News? You can't do that. You'll get canceled. Well, he had a conversation with Will Cain about a number of things, including the state of the world, the political scene, and more. And it seems the big guy isn't too happy about the state of the world at the moment. And uh, can you blame him? But what Johnson said during the conversation is truly stunning. And, you know, we use that word stunning a lot. It's a great clickbait headline, but I think this qualifies. You made that endorsement in 2020. Are you happy with the state of America? Am I happy with the state of America right now? Well, that answer is no. Q, I believe we're going to get better. I, I believe in that. I'm an optimistic guy, and I, I believe we can get better. Um, the endorsement that I made uh, years ago with Biden was one I thought was the best decision for me at that time. And I thought back then, when we talk about, hey, uh, you know, I, I'm in this position uh, where I have some influence, and it's my job then. I felt like that then. It's my job now to exercise my influence and share with this, this is who I'm going to endorse. Am I going to do that again this year? That answer is no. Why would he say that? All right, here are some possibilities. You let me know what you think. Johnson knows his movie star career is ebbing just a little bit. I mean, a year or two ago, he put out Black Adam. We all were waiting for, for Dwayne Johnson to be a superhero. There he is, and it didn't do well. That franchise just crashed on the runway. Or Johnson knows that supporting President Biden at this point is costing him fans, and he'd rather avoid the kind of partisan name-calling that people get in trouble for these days. Or he knows that Biden is just a terrible, awful president, and he'd rather pretend to be neutral than actually double down on a horrible, terrible choice. Or he can sense a cultural opening right now. Actors can be a little bit more open with their views without getting punished. All right, no matter what the answer is, and it could be something else, we've got a major A-list star who's refusing to back Biden in an election year. I guess the only question remaining is, is he going to be the only person to take that kind of stance? Or will other stars, big or small, follow his lead? Oh, stay tuned. Here's your movie trivia question of the week. The 1976 film The Omen is a horror classic. Why? It's good. It's very good. That music, that classic scene at the end, it all still packs a punch. I recently rewatched it with my son just to get him up to speed on a newer Omen film. And that, of course, is the first Omen. It's a prequel to the original story with Gregor Peck. It's in theaters right now. Now, the original film had Peck squaring off against a lot of different dogs in the film one owned by that creepy nanny, and another bunch of dogs that were at the cemetery where he makes a startling discovery. But all those dogs were the same breed. But which breed was it? The answer? At the end of the show. You know, it's always good to go back to your roots. And for me, that means interviewing the people who make movies. I mean, that's why I got into this gig. It's what I've been doing for years and years, but not as much lately. 
I used to do it all the time when I was working at the Washington Times. I even flew out to L.A. for a whole bunch of movie junkets. That's where you get together with a bunch of different journalists, and the, all the stars come at you, basically. There's about a table with eight or nine journalists. The star will sit down. You could pepper him or her with questions. Then you get a new star coming in, and the process repeats itself. But, you know, since the pandemic, I really haven't spoken to a lot of celebrities. I think part of it is that I spend a lot of my time on the culture wars. I talk about free speech. And I'm still going to do that. I'm still passionate about that. But it's also good to kind of put the politics aside and just have a great conversation. And that's exactly what I did with director Kia Roach-Turner. Now, his new film is called Sting. And it's a story about a girl who craves attention. There's a new little brother in her life. And it seems like that kid's getting all the love in the house. Or at least that's what she thinks. You know, you can understand why a teenager would think that way. So when she finds a good-sized spider in her bedroom, you know, gross, right? But... She says, let me decide, let me keep it as a pet. What could go wrong, right? And of course, she even names it. Charlotte! Hey there, little guy. We're gonna call you Sting. Cool. I don't think it's a spoiler alert to say that things go south from there. Now, Sting is great fun. I am a genre movie lover. This is smart. It's sophisticated. It's a really enjoyable film. So I couldn't wait to chat with Kia about it and also learn why he made it and also a little bit more about the special effects behind the scenes. It is a pretty cool story. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Kia Roach-Turner. No politics, no culture war stuff, just horror movie talk. And it is refreshing. I hope you'll agree. Well, Keith, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Hey, Christian. Um, thanks for having me. I, 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 I doubly appreciate it. Without <laughs> you guys, nobody knows my film exists. So you're a very important part of the process. Well, Thank you for choosing my film to chat about. You know, I want to start with the obvious is spiders. You know, there's something about them that unnerves us. I mean, I think they're in a way comparable to sharks it's just you know just from the, the get-go we're, we're uncomfortable is that one of the reasons why you you chose this project and wrote it or was there any something else that sparked the creation oh no a hundred percent um i have arachnophobia like proper bad arachnophobia so when i see a spider my first instinct is to cry which is not it's not helpful when your wife's screaming get rid of it and i'm crying she's like what are you doing um I'm useless when it comes to spiders. Um, I've always been terrified of them. So, you know, as a horror filmmaker, my job is to sit down and try and think of the scariest thing possible. And I wanted to do like a family-based single location horror where you've got like uh, one family trapped basically in a house or a single location menaced by a monster. So I had the family because I am a family man, so I just templated my own family. And, um, you know, some of the dramas that were going on um, – with me at the time, um, I, I knew probably the best thing to do was was to set it in a New York apartment building because how cool are New York apartment buildings? Um, uh, but I just didn't have a creature and I was like, well, what's the scariest thing that I could possibly think of? And because I'm an arachnophobe, the scariest thing I could think of would be a spider the size of a large bulldog that could bite you, incapacitate you, and then drag you fully conscious <laughs> into an air conditioning duct and then eat you over a period of days. I'm just like... That's the worst thing, the worst thing ever. And nobody had ever done it. Like like every year there's like a thousand shark films, but nobody's really done a giant spider movie since like Eight-Legged Freaks. Like nobody's really tried to do it in like a really commercial way mm. since Arachnophobia. And those ones, you know, they weren't even as big as your hand. You know, they were, they were you know, dangerous funnel web, uh, dangerous uh, tarantulas. But, um, you know, they weren't like I wanted to do a real creature feature with, with mm. a big one. And I just hadn't really seen anybody do it seriously. Eight-Legged Freaks was a comedy. And I wanted to make something that, you know, I mean, I don't mind having a bit of humor, but I wanted to take the subject seriously enough so that people were terrified from start to finish. And um, that was the goal, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny. There, there is some dark humor here. The uh, One of the older characters has a bit of dementia and there's some black humor in, in her approach. But did you ever think about making this more of a comedy horror? I mean, it, it clearly isn't. It's, it's more serious. It's more frightening. But was that, was that an element you considered early on, or is it always the point of this to make it as dark and scary as possible? No, I always wanted, I've always wanted to make, like, 
a straight up horror. And ironically, like this is me trying to make something just really disturbing and horrific. And it still ends up like a bit of a comedy. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think I just can't, I think it's just my style. Like I can't help it. Like I always like a bit of fun and adventure. Um, and even though I really want to scare the crap out of people, I, I kind of don't want to just out and out traumatize people. Um, even though, you know, that's kind of what you're supposed to do as a horror filmmaker. Um, and so, no, I never wanted to make it a comedy, basically because, like, a spider that big attacking a family, that's not funny <laughs> to me. That's a nightmare. So I allowed some of the sub-characters to be funny mm. and I allowed for some funny moments and some witty bits and pieces and whatnot um, and some, you know, situational comedy where you can't help but laugh even though it's horrible. But, no, no, I, I wanted to take this seriously mm. because I seriously am scared of giant spiders. So, yeah, um, yeah it, it felt it felt right, you know. Well, you know, also I think some of the best horror films do have those moments of humor that relieve the tension temporarily until you can get to ratchet it up all over again. I was curious, obviously there's a science fiction element with the spider. This is not your ordinary creature. But did you do any research on spiders beforehand to kind of get maybe some ideas or, or I don't know, just some sort of odd inspiration? Or did you just, just kind of run with your imagination given your, your, your real life fear? I did, and some of it made its way in. But I find the kind of filmmaking that I make, you know, usually it's just about imagination and what's the scariest thing you can think of, you know. Um, uh, uh, and I did put a bunch of spidery information and scientific stuff, and it all just kind of bleeds away. It becomes just expositional. And, um, yeah, I, I, but I, I do think that research is important. I think a lot of that stuff finds its way in subtly. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you just got to think of scary scenarios and scary set pieces and just, you know, let your imagination fly. And one of the good things about um, setting this up as a spider from space is I kind of can make it spider-like, but I'm not restrained by any sense towards realism. You know, I can just let it be whatever it needs to be. And I think actually one of the better ideas in the film was the idea to make it mimic so it can mimic bird noises and um, mm. it can mimic, uh, you know, there's a point where it's mimicking a crying baby <laughs> in order to lure the father up towards it. And I'm just like, oh, that is just such a disturbing concept, a giant spider crying like a baby to lure parents in to eat them. You know, I'm just like, oh, that's good. That's nightmare <laughs> stuff, you know, and that's got nothing to do with research or realism. Gotcha. You know, you know, it's funny. I grew up in the eighties and the horror movies at the time were lower budget and they looked lower budget. The acting was clunky at best. The special effects were pretty rough. You know, you're working in a, in a field right now where you can make a movie that has a smaller budget and it looks slick and the acting is first rate. Talk a little bit about that as a filmmaker, how uh, I guess that maybe the creative freedom it gives you. I, I know you'd always want a bigger budget, but just how does it, how do you tell a story in this kind of environment where the technology is, is your friend really? Well, yeah, you can make low budget, slocky, schlocky kind of movies. And a, a lot of my Wormwood stuff is, is, is that where we don't have a huge budget, but we make up for it with, you know, action and head explosions and lots of zombies. <laughs> and, um, you know, all that stuff doesn't cost a huge amount. Um, on this one, I think we're trying to sit on the, on the sweet spot, you know, that's been, you know, very much created by somebody like, um, you know, Jason Blum, you know, with Blumhouse and even A24 to a degree, they they kind of try and sit generally at about 6 million American, you know, which, you know, can sometimes translate to about 10 million Australian. Um, and so that way I can get, you know, the best company in the world to create my spider and I can get, you know, the wetter, Richard Taylor. Like, I mean, he, I mean, the, yeah, the, like the, those guys are phenomenal. So we're able to actually contact him with a, with a decent, with, with a budget that is not stupid and actually have him create, you know, quite, quite a difficult to build um, creature for us. And that's a whole other story. Working with him was phenom phenomenal. Working with wetter was like a dream come true, but um, it also means that we can get, you know, one of the best production designers in the country, Fiona Donovan, to build a New York apartment building for mm. us. I mean, that, you know, you've got to spend to, to do that. You know, like a, a DOP like Brad Shield, um, you know, I mean, this guy's a veteran. He's been working for God knows how many decades making these amazing images. Like, you know, you, you can't do that on the smell of an oily rag. So you just have to be very careful about how and where you spend because the film has to end up looking like a studio movie but it can't cost so much that, you know, you can't make a buck at the box office. So it's like it's quite a difficult um, um 
balance to get right, you know, budget versus result versus how much it earns, you know, um, you know, you could go crazy thinking about this stuff, but at the end of the day, you know, you get the budget that you're given, um, you make the movie that you make and then you just cross your fingers and everybody's works really hard. And, you know, you hope that you can make something vaguely zeitgeisty and original enough that, and scary enough that the audience has come, you know, so fingers yeah. crossed again, you know. I mean, I, I think you hit that sweet spot right, right dead center. But I, I want to touch on the special effects because as I'm watching the movie, a movie, I'm thinking, you know, a lower budget film, but it looks good. The spider is very impressive. And then I believe I've been reading that this is mostly practical effects. What can, what can you shed light on about that situation? Yeah, I mean, horror is a tactile medium. Like, it's just like if, if, if the creature... Um, or the horror elements are interacting with the actors and interacting with the space, you know, like moving furniture around, like mm. the shadows are moving across it correctly. And if there's smoke or rain, you know, it's like it's pattering off the the exoskeleton of the spider, you know, and you can see the the, the saliva dripping out of its actual, you know, fangs. Like all this stuff is important because it tells the human brain that it is real. And that's why all the best you know, horror films often did come out of the 80s. Like, you look at the effects in The Exorcist or um, uh, John Carpenter's The Thing, Rob Bottin's special effects in that movie are phenomenal. Like, it's it's real stuff. And it, and it really makes you feel like you've had the experience, whereas, mm-hmm. you know, some of these other horror films that rely too heavily on digital, like, it just, there's no gravity or weight to the creatures. And so... It's more dreamlike. It's more supernatural. It's like, well, it looks more like a ghost than like anything else. You know what I mean? Like, and I, I even think that the ghosts are better when they're played by <laughs> human beings. You know what I mean? I, I just think uh, there's something about a real practical element that is scarier than a digital. And so my law for this one was always let's push for practical as much as we can, keep the digital to a minimum. Um, and even when we do go digital, you know, they'll be very quick shots or they'll be hidden behind thick glass. Um, but, you know, having – and and I only ever went to digital when the spider was – you know, the frame was wide and the spider was completely in frame. Mm-hmm. Um, everything else was 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 a puppet and was interactive. Yeah. Um, but having said that, you know, um, the company Cumulus that did our digital spider – I mean, it was beautifully photorealistic, so I was very lucky on both counts. You know? Yeah, it's seamless with the, tra- the the transition between real and, and CGI for sure. Um, you know, when you think about what's going on in movies today, horror is having a moment. You know, you mentioned the lower budgets; they're doing very well at the box office. They're they're connecting with people. Any any thoughts as to why? I mean, you could say we're living in tough times. That's a I think that's a a, a logical answer, perhaps. But but you know, you, you seem very comfortable in this space. Why do you think that these films are are really scoring with audiences, maybe more so than usual? I saw a great meme the other day that was saying <laughs> that you know the reason why um, horror is doing so well is because you know we we've had a whole generation. Um, had their hope taken away. So it's the first generation where you're actively being told, hey, there's no future, like literally, huh. economically and physically. And so you're dealing with a generation who has, you know, doom hanging over it every day. Yeah, but that's a depressing answer. I don't want to go with that answer. Um, <laughs> my my answer is that, like, you know, horror's never gone away and it's always been successful. Um, it does seem to be having a transcendent moment where critics are taking apart horror the way they used to take apart like really important political films or Mm -hmm. dramas or, you know, like horror is being elevated to, you know, like a a true art form maybe for the first time ever. And that's great. But it's always been successful. Um, Comedy, romance, horror always do well if they're made well. You know what I mean? Because people need to cry and people need to laugh and people need to be scared. Like horror does something to the psyche that is important. Like in horror films, we go through the traumas that we're most scared of. um, And in some way that becomes curative. Um, And so, yeah, I I think horror plays a really important part in the psyche. You know, I want to wrap this up with one, uh, maybe another obvious question. You've gone to this project, you have arachnophobia. Did it make it worse or better? 
same. <laughs> I was hoping, I was hoping, for a few, um, I, you know, I was hoping like if, if I spend two straight years just thinking about spiders, researching spiders, looking at pictures of spiders, interacting with a giant spider built by Richard Taylor, this will cure me of my arachnophobia. It has done nothing. I'm just as scared of spiders, if not more now, because I, all I'm doing is thinking and talking about them and, and it's just reminding me of how much I hate them. So, um, yeah, no, it's, you know, hopefully audiences like it, but it hasn't helped uh, me any. <laughs> that's right. Well, One for Two is a really enjoyable movie. Thank you for joining the show. The new movie is Sting. It is in theaters nationwide April 12th. And keep up the great work and keep working in this genre. I love smart, talented horror filmmakers. We need more people like you. And uh, thanks again for your time. Thank you so much. Let's be clear, Larry David doesn't give a bleep about Woke. The Kirby Enthusiasm star made his character, also named Larry David, as cranky and as problematic as humanly possible for 12 seasons. And along the way, he never apologized for his jokes, even though he dipped his toes in some pretty challenging material. Uh, Me Too, the Middle East, the Holocaust, incest, you name the disgusting topic, the disturbing topic, the dramatic topic, he found a way to make it funny. And again, no apologies. Well, Curb just aired its final episode ever. 12 seasons, it is done. Goodbye, certainly not good riddance. I've loved the show. It's a little uneven. Certainly this season has been as well, but it has been a wonderful show and very, very funny. But I want to focus on the second to last new episode. It's about maybe 10 days old now. Now, the story has different angles. You know, these Kirby Enthusiasm episodes, they go off in different tangents. But one of them involves Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, the boss. He's there playing himself. And also the boss's representative, the press rep, people who help boss, you know, sell tickets, arrange things. You know what? Well, that character's name is Ken. But Ken was born a biological woman. And Larry, back in the day, apparently had a lot of sex with the person who now goes by Ken. And Larry didn't take the news well. Not so much. Small world, Larry. You and Ken sleeping together? No, no, no. I slept with Kendra, not Ken. Kendra's Ken. Kendra is not Ken. No, Kendra's Ken. Kendra's not Ken. Kendra's Ken. I am Ken. You had sex with me. Ken is Kendra. Kendra's Ken. Ken is Ken. Kendra is Kendra. And never the twain shall meet. Now, technically, what you just heard is dead naming. When you use the name of the person who they used to be, it would be like, don't call Caitlyn Jenner, Caitlyn Jenner. You would refer to Caitlyn as the name we knew that person to be for many, many years. And I'm, not, I'm treading carefully for obvious reasons here. Now, listen, people have a lot of emotional and conflicting views on the term dead naming. But let's just say... You don't do it very often, and if you're a Hollywood star, a comedian, if you're putting on a show and you do that, you, better than often, you'll get in trouble for doing that. You might even get canceled to a certain degree, or at least force one of those apologies that we've come to know and loathe. Well, not Larry David. Nothing happened that I could see. I've been scouring the web. I was just just curious, because after I watched the episode, I thought, oh my gosh, I can't believe they said that. But... In a weird way, why am I talking about it? It's like saying, well, you know that car over there? It didn't crash. You know that murder? Well, there was never a murder. The person just went home and they were fine. It's a non-story. So why am I talking about it? Well, I do think it shines a light on when social justice activists go crazy and they rage against something or someone and when they don't. So why did Larry dodge culpability for dead naming? I have a couple of theories. You could say he never apologizes for his jokes ever. He's got a track record. So the activist crowd knows he's going to ignore whatever they say. He's bulletproof. It actually reminds me of Adam Carolla. Adam Carolla has a strict apology. Sorry, I don't apologize for my jokes. And the woke activist mob never touches him, never tries to cancel him, doesn't even bring his name up. They just ignore him and they move on. Now, part of that is the fact that Adam Carolla has what he calls a pirate ship. He built his own company, so he he can't fire himself. But still, I think that no apologies mantra really does offer you, in a weird way, some protection. Or, Larry Dave is a very progressive guy. He recently came out and was bashing Trump for the 18th time, just to kind of show, show who he's made of. 
So the activists aren't as eager to take out one of their own as they would be with maybe uh, Tim Allen or uh, John Voight or other right-leaning personality. You know, so that's certainly possible as well. But there is another angle to the story, which I think is interesting, because sometimes you have to give credit to the actors who are involved in a particular sequence. I mean, they're reading the lines. They knew it was coming. They understood it, and they clearly accepted it. So in this case, we had an actual person who is a trans personality. His name is Ian Harvey. He plays Ken in the show. And again, he's a trans man in real life. He's also a comedian. So clearly, Ian Harvey didn't have an issue with this. He did as told. The skit went on, and they moved on from there. There was no outrage, no complaining to the press, no pulling out at the last second. You can point to any of these situations, but I do think it's important to point it out. And I also think the next time you see activists trying to cancel someone for saying that they dead name someone or just doing something that you're not supposed to do, just know that the activist crowd doesn't act consistently. And I think that speaks volumes. All right, let's circle back to that trivia question. When I was a kid, we had several dogs of the same breed. And it happened after we saw The Omen back in 1976. One of those dogs was named Damien. Gee, what a coincidence. Well, he was a Rottweiler, just like the other dogs that we had back to back to back, and just like the dogs that tried to tear apart Gregory Peck and The Omen. Now, I know they looked nasty and mean on screen, but I'm betting the Totos weren't the only family who saw those beautiful dogs on screen and thought, all right, maybe I'll train them a little bit, but I wouldn't mind having one of my own. They are beautiful creatures. Well, that's it for the show this week. Again, thank you to Radio America having me as part of their great podcast lineup. And while I have your attention, please drop by hollywoodintoto.com. I update it seven days a week. You've got news, reviews, and commentary on everything that's going on in Hollywood. And of course, go to YouTube, punch in Hollywood in Toto. The new channel is up. It's actually the old channel, but it's getting new content, new videos, not just as podcasts, but fresh takes on Hollywood, what's going on. And that channel, like this show and the website, we've been woke free for a long time. And I'll see you next time.